spine this morning. It's the third third Our attempt at this. We are supposed to be in now, people. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck YouTube. Let me repeat that. Fuck YouTube. As soon as I can, they're, to... they're our host. As, yeah, as soon as I find a way to not use you, YouTube, I will not use you. Yes, so you know. Okay, we are connected now. I can see us. Uh, I hope people find us in the channel. I just sent uh, a couple private messages saying uh, we are connected. Uh, people get this link. Boom. And we, since we are live and I can see as we are live, let's continue as nothing happened except <laughs> from the. See what I told you people before? Technical issues. It wasn't a joke. We were having technical issues, really bad ones. Um, we were what? Where were we? I don't know. Uh, we we're talking about Steve. You were giving us your opinion about Tivoli. Tivoli. Uh, so Tivoli, the amusement park in Copenhagen. First, I said was beautiful because it's more like being at a picnic than an amusement park because Danes are so uh, well behaved, uh, which I can't always say about my fellow countrymen in an amusement park. Uh, but the two rides that freak me out are the handbrake roller coaster, which is a roller coaster that literally only stops when a dude who's like a gondola driver pulls a big lever and makes the thing slow down and you're, you're just convinced you're gonna go right off the side of the track and crash to your doom. And then a haunted house, uh, which may or may not still be there, where instead of ghosts, it was medical malpractice. So like evil doctors cutting off your leg with a saw or people dying from influenza, which you know now is not a joke anymore, but uh, it's the weirdest haunted house I've ever been in. And I hope it's still there. It's <laughs> a name now to COVID-19 or something. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I didn't see, uh, I, I did see the roller coaster. Uh, but I didn't see that one because, of course, we were with a four, almost five-year-old at the time. So we didn't see that one. But I really want to see it. Is, is it still there, uh, Teddy? Well, it's a long time since I've been to Tivoli, so uh, I wouldn't actually know. Uh, okay, we need to get together. All I was going to say, we need to just drop this interview and go to Tivoli right now. <laughs> <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> oh, except we're still under lockdown here because we don't know how to wear masks. So I guess I can't go anywhere. Uh, that's true. I can go and visit Teddy. He can, he can come and visit me. But... We can't go visit you, and you can't come visit us. Okay, we can wait. Eddie, we can, Eddie, Teddy, we can wait to go to Tivoli for, you know, until Easter next year, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was telling uh, Teddy that we love Copenhagen so much. We've decided that in Easter, we used to go to Dublin most of the times. Now we decided to do Dublin and Copenhagen uh, every, every every two years. So uh, we can we can plan to go there and just go to Tivoli and, go, and do crazy things. Well, one of the big party games here is where you're going to move uh, if it all collapses, and Copenhagen's definitely on our list. Oh, you can you can also move to Spain. Well, we we have uh, no offense to Madrid, but Barcelona's on our list. Uh, I don't I don't I don't live in Madrid. Oh, I thought you, I met you in Madrid. So for some you met me in Madrid because I run the guest for yeah, that. Exactly. Yes. And, uh, same thing with Teddy. No, no, I live in uh, tw uh, literally 15 minutes away from Barcelona. In a well, there you have it. In a, small, in a small town so now i cannot leave uh well the craziness in the politics area the most trumpist politician in spain runs the runs the state of madrid and i was telling teddy that the government of spain said enough of your stupidity and they declared three hours ago the state of emergency in madrid because wow. the state of alarm because it's, they were handling teddy was telling me you know we have a better situation than in spain and i was like wait wait correction Better than the state of Madrid. <laughs> it's more or less fine with the second way, but that part is absolutely crazy. So uh, same thing. We I, I cannot live somewhere where there's no sea. You know, I need to mm -hmm. have the sea close because I always, I, I grew up with having the 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 sea like five minutes away from my apartment, my parents. So if you get me there, I just can't. I just can't. I need to to live nearby. Okay, so Barcelona. I will put you in one of the. 120 names I have from comic creators already telling me if Trump wins again, we're moving to, to Spain. <laughs> uh, why do you, and this is a question for you guys, for both. I guess that you read comics since you were kids, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but why of all the opportunities you had when you were kids, did you decide comics is what's in my heart and this is what I want to do? Steve or... You, Teddy, because you've been here longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Well, why? I think it's because I was drawing. I was uh, I was drawn to drawing. Uh, it's a wife next door, yeah. Um, and that got me hooked on uh, this telling stories. I was reading. Uh, I was reading uh, comics before I was reading books. Um, because it was so easy to read, it was uh, so appealing with the stories that were being told. Um, and I was in in uh, in Denmark. We were very lucky that uh, my local library was publishing a lot of uh, uh, not publishing. Uh, bringing home a lot of Spanish books, a lot of uh, French books, uh, uh, a lot of European books and American comics and underground comics. So we had uh, we had uh, Richie Corton and uh, uh, Gilbert Shelton of American comics and, uh, and we had uh, any French Belgian uh, book. Um, and it was so great to be exposed to that because uh, it was such a diverse storytelling that they were all doing. There was some Americans that were trying to break uh, what the traditional uh, superhero comics were doing, uh, and then there were uh, the what I started with was the Smurfs and uh, 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 I don't know what he's called, uh, little strong kid uh, uh, who can lift anything, uh, also by Peo. Uh, I don't know what the English name is. Uh, don't worry. The other page of thing, yeah, uh, not not, uh, not the you don't mean the the, um, the two characters that were that were the the book where the most were created, right? Um, he can run really fast. Uh, he is strong as God knows what, and he has a little French cap on. Uh, not the Smurfs. Okay, whatever. Yeah, and and uh, uh, Will, uh, who did a comic called Isabel. Uh, so I grew up on all these comics, and then uh, it was very natural to uh, just continue to read these comics because uh, I, I was reading those before I started reading books. Uh, and then, of course, I got curious about once I started reading books, then I was like, oh, they can also do something that uh, the comics can also do something. How can I connect these two uh, things? Steve? Uh, I hated comics and I did not read them when I was a kid because when I, I, my office is clean now. Well, kind of, uh, because of COVID I've, I've had plenty of time to redo everything. So I have the actual comic that my parents bought me Avengers 89, uh, when I was about six years old or something. And it scared the crap out of me. And I was like, I hate comic books. Don't ever get me more comic books. Although I still have this one. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was it. I quit comics after that one issue until uh, I was about 14 or something. And then my best friend, Eric Kopish was very into comics and uh, I started reading them again because he read them and I had to go with him to the comic shop or the grocery store or whatever every week. And I needed something to talk about that wasn't Spider-Man, which is all he was talking about at the time. So I got into X-Men and Marvel premiere uh, and I still didn't like comics. I was just like, these are dumb, but you're my friend. So I will read them. <laughs> and, uh, at some point that turned into actually loving them I don't remember the exact day <laughs> the exact day <laughs> you could say the year we're fine <laughs> well I, I do know like uh, like there was X-Men 114 where the X-Men are trapped in some kind of arctic waste or something and the soap opera of that really got me charged up and there was Jack of Hearts and Marvel Premiere uh, who had just the craziest costume and he was like half of his body was burned with some kind of experimental fluid. And I was like, that's so cool. Uh, so somewhere in that realm, I, I was like, I think I like comics. And then Frank Miller's Daredevil started coming out and I was like, I definitely like comics. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's what I was going to ask because for many people with American comics at least, uh, people who, t who tells me I, I hated comics and then I read Watchmen and, uh, and Dark Knight. I need to turn them around. Was it uh, was it that way for you, or was previous? It was, uh, as you said, uh, Frank Daredevil. So it was before, before that time. Yeah, definitely before. I'm I'm old. Teddy Teddy is young, and I am old, uh, but we're still friends. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I I I definitely I was very into the black and white books too. Like I started in with Renegade Press 
I worked at the company that spun out of Cerebus after the divorce. And I was very into that zone. So I was reading stuff that was not superhero-y to begin with and some superhero comics. And so Daredevil, Frank Miller, Klaus Janssen, Roger McKenzie's Daredevil run, uh, to my mind, uh, bridged that gap. It felt like an indie book, but it was a superhero. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of got me juiced on the possibility of superhero comics. So that was pre-Watchmen. And when did you decide that you wanted to do them yourself? I, so my friend Eric, again, uh, as I kept telling him how bad they were every week as we would buy and read these comics, uh, I, uh, at some point, Eric was like, well, then make your own or shut up was basically the challenge. And so I, I said, I'll show you. And I started sending in proposals for stuff. I sent in a, a Black Widow proposal that Tom DeFalco rejected. Uh, and I think my second proposal was for Kafka at Renegade Press, which they accepted. And then I had absolutely no idea how to write or make a comic book. But I was in college by that point. And I was like, well, I guess I'll just do this. And I found Stefano Gaudiano, who drew it, was also at my same college. And a mutual friend introduced us. Uh, and I was like, we're going to make a comic book. So he had made one before, at least. That was good. Uh, and uh, we literally just cranked out that series in my dorm room for six months. So what kind of writing had you done before, Steve? Had you written articles for it? Or a local paper, a school paper, or little short stories for yourself, or yeah, pretty much nothing. I had, uh, <laughs> I had, so I was a in college. I was an aerospace engineering major for a while, and I hated it. Uh, and my all of my electives were writing classes, like poetry, and I like. I, I've never been a fan of uh, not a fan, but I've never been attuned to prose. I've always been more into weird experimental poetry theater so i like i like the more concise writing forms and comics is more like uh drama or poetry or whatever when you get right down to it uh so that seemed to suit suit me it, it helped me definitely when i did com kafka the script was you know a car pulls up to a building have you seen him dan walks in or walks out and is spotted run you know it was like it was so sparse and i'm sorry teddy that it wasn't that way for you on house of secrets um but it was it was very 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 sparse which i think i try to get back to now uh, just doing less uh work but that was because of the stuff i was reading was very sparse mm -hmm. and in your case teddy what was your start Oh, I think it was all. It was one long. I read Hal Foster, uh, Prince Valiant, uh, and that created some sort of a language for me. That uh, what you call it? That you could tell different stories than the the very young stories that I had been reading, Lucky Luke, etc. And then all these uh, French comics, the first uh, Mobius, uh, the Hermetic uh, Garage. Mm -hmm. Uh, had just come out. Richard Colton's Den uh, had come out in 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 English, and those were like those were something very uh, different. Uh, and then among those uh, that appeared, just a little, it was a, like I was so attracted to this language and this uh, what words can do and what uh, pictures can do together. I was mostly uh, in love with the pictures at that point, but I was. Um, there was something stimulating me about what the words could do, but they were secondary at that point uh, to me because I was drawing. That was my little uh, uh, private space. And then all these American comics started to explore that even more, like uh, Frank Miller's uh, epic, uh, Steve's uh, Amazon uh, uh, with Tim Sale. They were doing this uh, with the, uh, they were creating stories for older people, uh, no, not for older people, for uh, more mature kids uh, any longer. And that was uh, that was very appealing, and uh, uh, and that made me try to push towards that. Uh, uh, even more, I cannot say exactly one comic that mm -hmm. uh, it's it like this. Uh, it was a mix of paintings and uh, books I started reading, uh, and then this continuous uh, love for the whole language of uh, comics. 
And then when I met Steve, that was when we both were very attracted. I was like Steve, very attracted to this uh, uh, abstract storytelling. Uh, so the first time we met, we, we found out that we both had this uh, affection for one of our first ones. I remember that we talked about was uh, Exotica by uh, Anthony Goyen. Yeah, yeah. Canadian. Uh, and I love that fact that he had told this story uh, where you were first seeing people in a, in a field and your immediate uh, illusion were that this was a picnic, this was a friendly gathering. And then as you were jumping back and forth uh, in time, then you realize that no, they're actually looking for the, the corpse of the kid, which is like the, the opposite of what you were doing. And that whole thing was just, uh, was so appealing. Uh, that way of telling a story, not in a linear story line, but uh, in this fragmented, uh, and you're sitting there, you're trying to make, uh, what is this? This is before, this is after, this is uh, this is now, this is... Uh, but uh, that's, that's something that I love about, uh, and we're getting into the part that I like the most about this, this, these conversations, which is the language, the language of comics, which I think is... Uh, very particular and very unique and i always make the same joke no joke and if you haven't watched any of these shows better for you because i repeat it almost every time. <laughs> um, because i always say that comics is the only art that can really define the theory of relativity <laughs> that's true because you guys as creators control time and space in any way or shape or form from the first corner of the first panel to the last corner of the last panel. You can manipulate time and space and control it. It doesn't have to be linear. You can spend, I always use Watchmen as an example because it's the simplest one. But of course, there's a lot more complex, even, even if people doesn't believe it, there's a lot of more complex examples than Watchmen. But it's, you know, Laurie, first issue you will remember, she's in the background in one panel. And then we see an issue five that she's in the foreground. And suddenly we know, oh, this is exactly the same time from her perspective, it's five issues later. Mm -hmm. So they've been manipulating time all along. So how do you think, what do you guys think about that? Uh, about that, and also about the shape of the panels, of course, the shape of the panels can determine if you're going faster or slower. Do you think, do you agree that comics is the only art that can really do that? Well, it can do that, it can do a lot more than that. I mean, the, the thing that Teddy and I, I think have tried to do in our work is always tell stories in different ways, like House of Secrets, is about a lot of things, but one of the things that about it's about is ways to tell stories in comics. You know, every single storyline, Teddy said, if I'm gonna do a monthly, I wanna constantly be challenged. And so I, I tried to take him up on that and every storyline was told in a different modality, you know, either a different use of panels, a different mode of storytelling, a different narrative stance, a different time stance. Uh, you know, they all, they all went somewhere different than the one before, which maybe didn't help the book survive because it was it was a head scratcher for a lot of people but that's what we love about comics you know we did a a book together called genius and it started with just me telling teddy you know we're going to do this story and there's going to be a moment where the main character hears something that is incomprehensible uh and is trying to sort it out and i want you to take just a grip of pages and cartoon the incomprehensible i want readers to stop at that point and go what the fuck is happening here uh, and because that's what it is inside that guy's brain. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're not going to explain it. We're not going to give a caption that lets people off the hook. They're just going to have to deal with it um, because that's what the moment is like. And you'd be hard pressed. You could do that in film, but it would be it would be tricky uh, and you'd probably be shot down. But when you're just two creators doing a project, you can go, we're going to jump off this diving board water or not in the pool. <coughs> and that's that's the thing that I love most about comics. But it's not always rewarded. <laughs> but it's such a, what you call it, the great thing about comics versus uh, making films is this that uh, once you start films, uh, it's uh, any kind of film work, it's such a big collaboration between people and comics is just uh, two people uh, and an editor if, uh, if you are involving somebody else, but mostly it's just uh, an artist and a writer that are just working with no limits, no, uh, 
you don't have this uh, budget limit of oh you cannot do this and no we cannot do that voiceover you cannot do it it's anything is possible mm -hmm. as long as you can figure out how to draw 500 horses and etc uh, uh, etc et whatever the scene uh, is asking for we've been working on a project for a number of years that'll hopefully be our next thing at some point where we don't even know what we're working on so it's literally a comic book that that will be defined the minute it's finished but until then neither teddy or nor i knows what it is uh and it's just out of this love of creating process to tell the story in a way other than here's my script draw my script letter these balloons here's the comic you know there's there's plenty of that uh i don't i don't think that we need a ton more of that but there are so many other ways you can come at what the final product is and Teddy and I are just trying to explore some of that before we're dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's also really a really interesting part about what you guys just said. You, Teddy, you were mentioning the lack of budget and all that, but it's also something really special about comics is the synergy. Of course, between you guys, between the artist and the writer, when one has an idea and the other, even not being known by the writer originally, completes it in a way that you didn't expect. But when you see it's like, yes, of course, this is what it has to look like. So is that synergy for you guys at this at this stage in your career? It's just automatic. It's, I don't want to know what to expect from him, but I know I'm going to love it anyway. I, as I get older in comics, I'm really trying to embrace that. I wish, Teddy, you had met me uh, now instead of 30 years ago or whenever it was. but. Uh, because I, I went through that period of here is my script and this is what the thing will be. Now I've really, I'm trying to let go as much as possible because the best of everything is the intersection of the two minds. And I think Teddy and I have a lot of good intersection in our past, but I, I know how to do it now. Like I, I'm confident in what I do enough to not worry that Teddy won't give me what I need. Whatever Teddy gives me will work is the answer. Uh, yeah. And I think when you're a more insecure writer, especially, you think, if I don't get exactly what I saw in my head, but you're not drawing it, so who cares what's in your head? Uh, yeah. If somebody else is drawing it, you need what's in their head, uh, and you need them to be as free as possible getting that out of their head, as opposed to driving them crazy trying to make sure it's this thing you have in mind. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm very much at peace with whatever comes my way. I know I can make it into a finished thing, which is why we came to this new process where I don't even know what the book is. It's just going to show up at some point and that's going to be what it is. Uh, that's me, Teddy. What do you think? Well, yeah, but I've always, uh, when we work together, Steve and me, it's always been this, uh, <clears throat> if, of course, if there's something that I totally misunderstand, then uh, what do you call it? I would redraw it or uh, repaint it or whatever. Uh, but I've always tried to uh, read uh, and try to understand, and then we talk about what uh, uh, this scene has been about, or we've had conversations about the book where we're going towards, and that's been uh, uh, what you call it, been the the, the goal uh, that I've been going towards. And then sometimes, uh, which I try to do something that is hopefully going in the same direction and uh, at the same time maybe bringing something uh, new to the idea that's the great thing about collaboration is is that you if you can uh, continue to build on top of one another if uh, you know uh, we have a conversation and it's one thing then steve will write something and that suddenly that brings the conversation to another level and then i'll try to see if can i lift it and then steve will go over it again and each time it just uh, lifts the whole, uh, either by adding more words or removing words, or uh, it's this constant, uh, wonderful evolution. Yeah, that's so. So the oh, I'm not, sorry, just in one one more thing on that real quick that crossed my mind, which is on that genius book. You know, like when when the pages started coming in, I was in my mind going, "Oh my god, this thing is so." gray like there's just why is he so why is everything so monochrome and what's he doing you know i was very racked with concern and just like a hundred pages came in there's no color i'm just like oh, teddy you're killing us what are you doing you're so good with color 
when we get to the moment where that unknowable idea shows up, boom, here comes the color. Like it just explodes all over the place. Uh, and that's that's not an idea in the script at all. That's using <laughs> his knowledge of art to make that moment really, really come alive. Uh, and I had no idea that's what he was going for. But as soon as I saw that sequence, I was like, oh, I get all these other pages now. You were, you were holding back so that this would shock people and you know, startle them out of their complacency. Uh, and that, that's not an idea I would have had. So if you aren't open to what the other person is bringing, you shouldn't really collaborate. Yeah, you shouldn't be doing comics. Do go write a novel, right? As, as I always say. Uh, but it's all about layering. I love it because it's layer after layer for you guys. It's uh, Steve, you create the first layer, or you create it together because you talk about the idea first, I guess. But then you create it goes to Teddy, who creates another layer that comes back to you, and you create another. So you're actually making a big pie. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're making a, a thing that doesn't depend on what's the idea, what's the script, what's the art. It depends on how you guys, your synergy grows and grows in that same project and makes it change from what the original idea was. Because talking about Genius, it sounds like, or any other of your works, but especially Genius, it sounds like it started as something, but it turned into something completely different at the end, right? It's it's both the thing it started out as and it's a thing that's totally different. And that's what's cool about it. I Every time I work with anybody, but especially with Teddy, I'm... I don't think about, because Teddy likes a full script in general. He likes to know what he's dealing with. And so one of the things I would do on House of Secrets is change the way the script was formatted uh, so that it, at least it wouldn't get boring in form and it would also inspire different executions. But I, I fully plan on rewriting it after I see what Teddy has done. So I don't go, oh, look at these pages. Now I have to rewrite everything. I can't wait to rewrite everything um, because there's going to be stuff in the art that I see and that makes me go, oh, I don't need to say all this stuff. It's I'm looking at it. Or there's stuff in the art and I go, oh, I should I could say this now because that expression makes me think of X. Mm -hmm. So the rewrite uh, on the on the dialogue especially is one of the most fun parts of the collaboration because it gives you new eyes to look at the story with. So mm -hmm. I I love that part. Dave, <clears throat> do you want to tell about our our uh, comic book? What uh, what the process is? Uh, should we sure <laughs> or you want me to do it yeah that's what i was thinking <laughs> you could do it uh so i'm, I'm fight <laughs> well we had done we had done teddy had done a book called the red diary uh by himself during this time where we're supposed to be working together and i was like how dare you do a book without me uh and then uh he sent me a copy and it was lovely but it was in danish which i don't speak and i'm like well i don't even know what the hell this thing says but it's pretty uh, and then he was like, oh, maybe you could put it out through image. And I was like, nope, because I didn't work on it. So too bad. I, my deal with images, I have to work on it. Uh, and he's like, well, why don't you translate it? And I was like, because I don't speak Danish. Uh, and then he sent me a, a edition of it in French. And I was like, I don't speak French either. Uh, <laughs> but I, I kept the books for a while. And then eventually I was like, I think I know what this book's about. And so I translated it just guessing. Uh, you know, everywhere there was a balloon, I would put a balloon or whatever. And so I, Teddy's like, well, I can just send you, I have the script in English. I'm like, no, 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 that's okay. I got it. Uh, and I said, keep your script and I'll send you my script and we'll trade one day. <laughs> so I finished my script. I sent it to Teddy and he was like, oh dear, uh, it's very different. And sent me his script and I was like, oh dear, it's very different. <laughs> and, and we decided just to publish both of those versions as a flip book uh, with his actual translation and then my, what we call a transliteration. And it was really cool because it showed that the same sequence of images with the same balloons in the same places could tell two completely different stories, really different stories. Mm -hmm. um, so that blew my mind. I was like, well, that means that the script really is kind of arbitrary, the dialogue script, when you get right down to it. Because if I could tell two completely different stories with the same sequence of pictures, all bets are off. Yeah, uh, and so we said, well, what's what's the next evolution of that then? And so Teddy had this idea for a book. And I said, well, don't tell me the idea, and don't script it. Just just draw that book, and then make all the panels. So the panels are the size that I'm seeing here on the screen. They're all rectangles, uh, wider than than taller. I was like, then don't send me pages. Send me panels. 
mm -hmm. and send them to me in random order so that I have no idea where you are in the book you're making. And when I get them all, I'm going to, like a jigsaw puzzle, put it together. I'm going to try to guess sequence and I'm going to try to guess dialogue. So you not guys are fucking nuts. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So so it's it's it literally is a jigsaw puzzle that I get to put together and then I get to intuit what Teddy was trying to make, script it, and then that's the book. So whatever Teddy's working on is guaranteed not to happen. And whatever I'm working on is guaranteed to not have any basis in any starting idea from me at all, uh, which is very different than the other things we've done. And the book will be this this kind of cool arrival point, this kind of cross section of our creative thoughts. Neither one of us will have the book we set out to make because there is no book that we set out to make. Mm -hmm. that but it'll still be a book and I think it'll still be good and it'll still hold up, but we you won't know, have gotten there by any traditional modes. Is there is there any fear from you guys about what's behind that hill, you know, the precipice that is, oh my God, are we going to be able to pull it off? Or is just, you know, all bets are off, let's just do it and see what happens. No, I know we'll be able to pull it off. Like I trust uh, Steve so much that uh, I know he can pull off anything. It's like... Can I I, I have I have like 60 of the panels. I have no idea from where they are so far, but I could do a book on those 60 panels. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not I'm not worried. I'm excited. I can't wait. Steve's the master. I've been sitting with Steve where he's been asking me to feed him uh, three words and then I feed him a uh, fireman, whatever. And then he blows me away with the quickly telling a story that uh, involves exactly all those words. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't asked you. He's a master. We don't we don't tell him that that so too often because no, he, no one tells me that too often. We, we have That's to tell him that every once a year, you know, <laughs> not not that much. Now, can I say I haven't asked you why and what why did you guys have started to work together? I met Teddy at San Diego Con and he was I, I was very the con had just gotten large, too large that year. Uh, and now it's like 10 times bigger than that. But I was just, I was exhausted and uh, just wanted to leave. And then I saw Teddy and Hope, his wife, sitting at this table. And they were just so calm and pleasant. I was like, I'm just going to stay here until they ask me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew Steve, who had done uh, the Amazon book. I hadn't read, read uh, Kafka at that point. But I knew his Amazon work with uh, Tim Sale. And I was in love with that book. Uh, so once we got connected there, then uh, we started faxing those days when you were. Ah, yes, I remember faxing. <laughs> ah, faxes. <laughs> People now will be like, can you fax that to us? And I, I, my answer is no, because no one has that technology anymore. In Germany, you have to, uh, to have a, what you call it, uh, establish a company, you have to have a fax machine. Yeah, hospitals here are obsessed with faxes. I'm like, shouldn't you have state-of-the-art technology? <laughs> <laughs> Funny here because you, you send, you know, for legal notices, you send a bureau fax that was really important uh, legal. legal. You know, if you want to quit a company or whatever, you want to sue somebody, you have to send a legal notice that is called a bureau fax. Funny hmm. thing is that you don't have any, you, don't, you can't do it in paper anymore. <laughs> you do it through, through the post office, but you do it online. That's so, great. So the person receives it in paper, you know, as a legal notice because they have to, but you don't create it in paper. You create it on your computer, send it, and then the guy from the post, you know, the post guy, the postman or the postwoman, they goes and delivers it in hand because that's the law. They have to get it in hand, so it's you know, so they know they've been called, they've been sued or something like that. But you, <laughs> you don't create it in paper, so it's a really we just a position of technology, you know, with the old ways. They still yeah. have to get it. <laughs> In their hands, but you don't, you can't create it in hand. You have to create it in the computer. But yeah, anyway, my wife has a phone fax thing where you just take a picture and it it sends it to a fax machine, which is like what? <laughs> that's, okay, that's so crazy. Um, okay, back to your question, real quick. The we met at that San Diego Con. We said, oh, we should work together at some point. And then the first time I worked with Teddy, whatever it was, uh, what was it? Was it House? Is the first thing we did, or did we do something? I can't even remember anymore. It was House. Uh, but whatever it was, like after one issue, I said, can we just work together until we're dead? Because it was so fun and easy and whatever. I was joking, but now I'm holding him to it. Uh, but, you know, when you when you work with people in I comics. I think you're holding each other to it, not just you. Oh. Exactly, no, but... 
but you, you have to get over that how do we work together phase and you know it is fun to work with new people but it's also really great to go oh i know i know teddy and i know that whatever batshit crazy idea i throw at him he's not gonna run for the hills or maybe he will uh you know it, it, it's nice to not have to start with all that stuff but to just start right in on something uh and so having a big long work career together is great that way mm -hmm. that's that was going to be my question how do you think the way you work together has evolved organically or just whatever jump over the hills so as just say then whatever happens happens it's yeah. it's both yeah exactly T Teddy, like I said, on house especially to do a monthly wanted invention. Mm -hmm. So that that was a constant. Like every storyline, I'd be like, "Well, what what are we doing now?" Like, and it was great. It's great to. I always talk about the toolbox when you're a creator. You have your toolbox, and you go, "Oh, I just learned perspective. Oh, I just learned mood. Ah, theme. A theme hit me too late. Like I, my original stories had themes. Now I really understand how to work with theme in a way I didn't then." Uh, and that's in my toolbox now. And I think that so long as your toolbox is stocked, you're in good shape, but you can stagnate. You know, I have a lot of creators that I really enjoyed when I was younger who got to a point when they're like, well, that's it. My toolbox is full. Now I'm just going to make comics that look like this for the rest of my life. And they just, they start mm, yeah, from on an interest level. They're still competent, but they're not very interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm, constantly wanting to keep putting things in the toolbox. I think if you don't do a book where you're terrified now and then, you should probably hang it up because nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to find out each story has to be told in a in a different way. Like if you just repeat a war story uh, with the same uh, art and words uh, as you would approach a love story, then you're something is not communicated yeah i guess in a ways that is like uh, kubrick or even steve soderbergh right that you're trying to challenge yourself with every product and do something different do not stagnate and and i see what what steve says with with uh, novels movies but especially in comics there comes to a point with certain creators but i stop being interested if i see that you know two three books are the same it's like okay toolbox is full as you just said there's nothing new here. He's not trying yeah. to do something new. And even if it's good, it's like I've repeat, I've read this four times already. Why would I read it a, fi a fifth time? Yeah. That's what happened to you guys too as creators too and as readers? Say again. That's what happens to you as creators too. You know, like if you get, if you find out that you're repeating yourself, you just want to kill yourself and go out and do another, <laughs> another project. Because it happens to me, and I don't create a lot. But when I see him repeating myself, you know, the second time I see it, I just like, ah, I don't want to do this anymore. Throw it out of the garbage bin and start again. Well, that's uh, uh, what you call it. Uh, have you ever seen the film by Lars von Trier? I can't remember what the name is. Uh, Obstacles, I think it is. Mm -hmm. It's where you have to. Uh, it's a. It's a Danish. Uh, uh, director, uh, who's, I know, I know, Lars von Trier. <laughs> uh, uh, Lars von Trier is a Danish director, but uh, what you call it? Uh, but the one he has this dialogue with is another Danish uh, yes, yes. tree director, and he keeps giving him uh, these uh, obstructions uh, to uh, what you call it to challenge him to uh, to you know make him tumble and not be in this comfort zone. Uh, to make him think, to make him uh, creative, basically. Yeah. So to keep, so he keeps saying, "Oh, but you, uh, is it the next one you have to do in uh, animation." And he goes, "But I hate animation." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then he has to find out how this whole language uh, uh, works. Uh, so he has these five instructions uh, that he has to to do and and that is basically you need to keep yourself uh not uh what you call it just repeating yourself because then you're just yeah unchallenging yeah i mean i i, 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 I give myself a lot of uh, excuses for why my career is not better than it is uh but the main one i give myself is that uh, whatever book i do the next book alienates whoever liked the book i just did uh, so, you know, like in the last couple of years I did, I did get naked 
mm-hmm. uh, which is a bunch of essays, you know, comic yeah. books. Like I love essays. Can you do comic books as essays? And whatever the audience is for that, it's not the audience for my book that followed up, which is Camp Midnight for, you know, 10 year old girls basically. And that's where my head is now. Like if I do, if I do one kind of book, I don't want the next book to have anything to do with it because I just did that. Uh I want to really be somewhere completely different, which makes it hard to bring an audience with you. Uh, But it, it keeps me on my toes. I think everything I do with Teddy, I know he's game. I know he's down for the experiment. Uh, so I'm, those are always very exciting books to, to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but then just on my regular kind of whatever, you know, people are like, well, would you go back to Marvel? And it's like, to do what, you know, if they would let me take a, a superhero team and blow it up, you know, and go absolutely nuts on it, maybe, but that's not going to happen because those are commercial properties that have to do X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to work at image where they'll let me just do whatever. Eric Stevenson, I always go, Hey, this one's for girls. He's like, good. I'm like, Hey, this one's essays. He's like, do it. Uh, that's where I'm going to work. You know, <laughs> that's where my brain is these days. Absolutely. Um, so the first time you were together, as you remember his house, house of secrets. And um, then, uh, you did fashad, of course, fashade. I never pronounced it the right way. Uh, how did, uh, and I have to ask about this because there's, there's a new edition in Spain, as you know. Uh, how did It's a Bird come to life? Why Why did you decide to do it? And it's especially that way. Because you remember <laughs> back in the day, people thought it was going to be your Superman book. And it wasn't. Or not specifically, it wasn't your Superman book. It was about you. So and for, anybody, for anybody watching, David, I think you're referencing that Teddy did a Superman European album. Yeah, which I was, was very, there. <laughs> yeah. And then this book was nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you did your, your European album, Superman and the Bomb of Peace, was, co- was going to Spain. And then all the way around, you got to it, It's a Bird. Uh, how was mentally for you guys to get to that book? And what was the idea behind it? Why did you want to do... Uh, it's a bird. Well, it started with uh, Steve being at the toilet in my house. <laughs> it's, it's entirely true. I found that it helps Teddy finish a project if I show up at his house, knock on the door, and go finish the project. Uh, and so we were doing that on on house, uh, and we planned to keep doing house. We were going to do more painted versions like facade uh, to keep it going. And uh, we were talking about what the next house thing would be after facade, I think, and just trying to figure that out. And I went to take a a piss in Teddy's toilet, which is a very small room uh, at the time. I think it's been expanded since then, I'm not sure. And uh, literally while taking a leak, I came out and I was like, Teddy, I think I know what our next book is and it's Superman. Like I thought of the entire book exactly as it is except for two pages. during the course of one urination. And it wasn't that long of a urination. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but I, I've only had two projects that came to me in a flash and that was one of them. And I was like, so the problem is it needs to be a Vertigo Superman book, which they're never going to allow. Uh, and the other problem is you need to paint it in about 25 different styles, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the 25 different styles, I knew we wouldn't have an issue with the Superman and Vertigo. I. I didn't see any way around it, but it had to be Superman or else it wasn't going to work. Uh, like a, a stand-in wouldn't be the same. So uh, Teddy was immediately on board. We talked through it. He was like, oh, yeah, okay. We had all these ideas. Uh, that part was easy. And I was like, well, let me work on Karen Berger because I don't know I don't know how this is going to happen. And uh, luckily, San Diego was somewhere in there. And I was in an elevator at, uh, David, I think you were there back in those days where everything was at the top of the Hyatt Hotel. Yes, on the Uh, fourth floor. All the creators went to this bar at the top and that's where all the good gossip went down. And I, of course, I'm I'm a little crowd phobic. So I did that for about 10 minutes. I was like, why did I come here? I got to go back to my hotel room. And so I got in the the hotel elevator, very tall building. And writing down uh, in the elevator was Paul Levitz who you know, I had been working for for many years, but I had not really met him officially. I knew he didn't know who I was at all. Uh, and during that elevator ride, I heard him say to somebody in the elevator, just this little fragment, he goes, 
well, I don't know why people won't bring DC Comics, Love and Rockets. I would have published Love and Rockets or Bone. I would publish Bone, but nobody ever thinks bring Bone to DC. They're, they think we're all conservative. But I really, I would take big risks if people would bring us books like, and then that was it. The elevator ride was over. So I was like, I was remembering that after I had talked to Teddy. And I, I wrote to Karen. I'm like, Karen, we have this idea for a book. It's got to be this, that, and the other. And it's got to be Superman. Da, 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 da. Uh, and she was like, well, yeah, the book sounds really great, but Paul's never going to go for that, which I knew she would say. And I was like, okay, hey, Karen, let me uh, talk you through this part of the book and why it has to be Superman. And I told her about the themes and the whatever, and I was like, it would be like Arkham Asylum, only more real world, and you know, can really redefine. She's like, I do love all of that. She goes, but Paul's just never going to say yes. We're not allowed to use Superman at all or DC characters, really. We're going to more creator-owned. And I knew she would say that, too. I was like... Karen, that's cool. Let me write Paul a letter uh, that you could give him. And in this letter, I just, I, among other things, I said, dear Paul, I, I think you're a brave man. I think you're the kind of guy who would take big chances, but I bet nobody ever trusts you to do that. So I'm trusting you with the best idea I've ever had for a book, but you've got you've to lock down and go, hey, this is going to be our bone. This is going to be our love and rockets. You've got to think big, uh, you know, just shamelessly using this snippet of conversation I'd heard. And so I said, Karen, give Paul this letter, have him read it while you're sitting there and see what he says. Uh, and I don't know if she did that exactly, but she she went to a meeting. She's like, okay, I'll give it to him, but don't hold your breath. And she called me a day later. She goes, Paul approved it on the spot. So that's how we got that through somehow. Because it is a book about probably, how much- Probably thinking, probably thinking, how did he know that? <laughs> But it, it's a book about how much I don't like Superman published by the people who control Superman. So that's that's an interesting... It is risky, and I, I applaud him for going there. Mm -hmm. And how was it for you, Teddy, aside of the leaking part? He was, uh, I, remember, I remember Steve coming back from some lunch and remember, remember him going, she said, yes, it's a, it's a go-ahead. And then it was just this, uh, I really loved doing that book. It was such a great uh, uh, opportunity to do all these voices uh, and try to find out how to how to do them different and how to do them, uh, uh, again, uh, what you call it, adding to the story. Uh, yeah, for people, people who don't know, there's a main story that's in one style, and then there are 20 short stories about different mythic explorations of Superman and Teddy had to do a completely different art style for each short story. Keep was, going, Teddy. Say again? Okay, keep going, please. Uh, that was a, it was just a, it was a wonderful opportunity because that's what, that's what interests me, what you call it, to uh, find out how to tell these different stories and still how to, uh, uh, obstruct uh, everything for myself so I don't repeat myself. Uh, uh, and this was a wonderful story and, uh, and, and a wonderful backstory that you constantly have to keep in mind uh, uh, with uh, this writer that is in the story and the, the, all the issues that he's going through mm -hmm. um, uh, about a, a very serious disease. Um, that was you kept having to have this in the in the back of your head when you were drawing each mm -hmm. of yeah. did you want to kill and yourself many times during that? <laughs> did you want to kill yourself many times during that project no never because <laughs> no, another new style oh my god <laughs> yeah, well, i was like <laughs> how much and then, and then he he won the eisner for that art uh, and couldn't come to San Diego. So I accepted the Eisner on his behalf. That we'll pretend this phone is the Eisner. Uh, and I was like, hey, Teddy says thanks. Blah, blah, blah. And I sat down at my table and I've I've been nominated for a lot of Eisners and I've lost every single one of them, including <laughs> two more this year. I've been nominated in four different decades. Never, never won. So I'm holding Teddy's Eisner. I'm like, oh, look, it's finally an Eisner. And somebody from DC goes, we'll send that to him and snatched it right out of my hands. So that's oh my really God. The only Eisner I've ever touched was Teddy's and only really for a nanosecond. Well, we can, uh, you're the Kirk Douglas of comics then. I don't care. Who cares? It's a popular <laughs> contest. Kirk Douglas was I get one and then I'll care. <laughs> 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 How much of you is, uh, there is in, uh, in It's Over, Steve? How much of me? It's, 
it's definitely autobiographical, but I, I tell people it's semi autobiographical because to tell the story, it's this, it's about my family dealing with Huntington's disease, which is a terrible disease. Uh, and I wanted that to be genuine, but to make the story work, I had to change a lot of things just because of the, the time compression needed to make an A story with 20 short stories that keep interrupting it. It had to happen in a much more condensed time frame, which meant I needed to move my character to New York, for example. Like, it's not interesting to have conversations via fax and FedEx and whatever. You need those people to interact. Um, I needed to compress time about what happened to my aunt and my grandmother and stuff in ways that, that just necessitated, uh, you know, being untruthful about those facts. I wanted to have my now wife, Liesl, in the story, but she wasn't around at that time. But the the kind of people who are in my life that represent the stuff she goes through were around. So the things that people think are autobiographical, like me punching Joe Kelly in the face, uh, never happened at all. That's just for good drama. And the things that are true, people think I made up. So <laughs> a lot of it's real, uh, but not the parts usually that people think. And mm -hmm. um, Teddy, is there in uh, in your collaborations, this is the the one that we can say is semi autobiographical by Steve. Is there has there ever been the other way around where it's you in the in those stories? In a genius, <laughs> it's a uh, it's a uh, hope and uh, Theodore, I think he's called uh, Ted. Yeah, Ted. Yeah, uh, and I semi did those based on uh, on me and uh, my dear wife Hope. Mm -hmm. And how did it feel? That was fun. It's always fun to. Uh, it's always fun. Didn't you feel like uncomfortable? But it's not you. It's a. It's a story. It's fiction. It's a. It's a. It's not the same as drawing a story for about my life and. Uh, uh, so. It's pure fiction. It's uh, yes. That's that, that's 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 exactly what I what I was asking. How much of it touched you as real, or you kept it all like this is not me? No, because it's uh, it's you just use that as a resource for or a source for uh, for uh, small parts uh, and uh, and nothing more. That's mm -hmm. it. yeah. Genius was was me using Teddy and his family from an observer kind of perspective, but putting it on a story that was about literally about Liesl's grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, Teddy loves biographies and Steve loves experiments. So we tend to do a book that's biographical then a book that's totally experimental or we merge them when we can. Mm -hmm. um, so Teddy doesn't, Teddy didn't particularly want a book about Teddy, but uh, there was some interesting family stuff happening with him at the time about raising kids and you know just relationship maintenance and whatever that were bits and pieces of conversations we had had over the year that I just stole and shoved into a, a story that was also a biographical about Liesl's grandfather. Uh, so, uh, but again, semi, like Liesl's grandfather knew a very big secret of the 20th century. He was a, uh, he worked for the um, Atomic Energy Commission. And I wanted to write a story about the frustration of not being able to find out what he knew about this thing that I'm not gonna tell you what it is because I don't wanna be asked about it. Nope. Um, and so we, we shifted that to a lost Einstein theory. So that's just made up. But then everything about this idea of knowing something that's lost to time and somebody trying to dig that out of their psyche came from me dealing with Liesl's grandfather. Mm -hmm. The stuff about the family side of the story is not about Teddy's family, but it came about because of conversations we were having about family and kids, because he had three daughters and I had none. And it was really fascinating to hear about all that mm -hmm. uh, and put that into a story. So when we do biography, we're not we're not going, I woke up and had toast. You know, it's not that kind of biography. <laughs> That's it. It's, uh, it's more genre infused, but it, it's the heart of it is real. Mm -hmm. uh, and the story of it is fantastical. Yeah, that, but that's that's the part that I, that I wanted to ascertain in a way, which is since it's a bird is more you, if genius was more Teddy in, in that way, and how much of a reality it was, or just, you know, taking, as you said, bits and pieces, elements that you, you could use for your story. 
So it wasn't real until auto even semi biographical. It was just bits and pieces that you could use because they fit, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's and again, it's just coming back to theme. Stories are what are you giving an audience? What are you giving a reader? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's for too many people. That's a stack of plot points, and I'm so done with that kind of story. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I need to be given something that I leave and I, it changes the way I think about my world. It changes the way I live my life. It changes the way I interact with people. So I start with that now. I go, what am I going to give you if you read this comic book uh, that will be worth your time and worth the 15 bucks or whatever you spent, uh, whether you know it or not? And, I, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite films is The 400 Blows, which I hated the first time I saw it. I could not have hated it more. And then years later, I was very depressed and I was thinking about, you know, Antoine Donnell running into the ocean and stopping and having nowhere left to run. Like, that's it. And I was like, oh my God, that is haunting, that moment. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't get it when I first saw it because I wasn't in a place in my life where it mattered. And when I was in a place in my life where it mattered, that artwork got me through, you know, it helped. Yeah. So I'm always thinking of stories in that way and the other weird corollary of that is that people come at a story from their frame of reference. So I, I used to battle people at conventions who'd come up and go, oh, I really liked that, you know, uh, your, this issue of X-Men was about uh, liberation. I'm like, it's not about liberation. It was about, and I'd tell them what I had in mind. And that's really idiotic because for that person, it's about liberation. Yes. So this is all, you're giving people symbols. You're hoping they see it the way you see it. But if they don't, if they saw it in any way that resonated with them, that's valid. Mm -hmm. So now I'm very, I'm very interested. In it. It's more interesting to me that people read a book and get something totally different out of it than what I had in mind, um, because that means their life put them in a place where those symbols added up in a different way, and that's that's fascinating to me. That's also the really interesting part, Teddy. If you, I don't know if you agree, because comics, as I always say, work. Uh, out of pattern recognition in many ways. We don't need to see any, to see everything. It's suggested and then we complete it. Even if, as I, as I said before, relativity, blah, 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 control time and space, it's also at the same time really funny because it also needs a huge amount of reader collaboration. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And then the reader you give him, as, as Steve says, you can give him A, but he can say delta or gamma or theta or whatever. They're going to interpret whatever the fuck they want. Because again, it's pattern recognition. Is oh, I you, I hear a bush moving, and I think there's a tiger there. It's gonna kill me, you know, like like the caveman. But other people are gonna say, oh, I'm just going to go there and play with the rabbit, and then get killed by the tiger. But anyway, do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's also always about giving them clues. It's the part that I love the most about comics when they try to literally tell me every single fucking detail, and go so baroque. It's like this is not a comic. I need to be able to interpret and get the answers myself. What do you think about that? Well, I also would exactly like what Steve says. It's then the reader puts in exactly what they were. It can be, you know, you can read two books at two different times, say 10 years apart, and you're at different points in your life, uh, different parts in your life, and you will get something different out of the story because your focus is... Uh, is you're more grounded or you're more frustrated or whatever so you will you will grasp different things but if you spell it out uh, and make the story just one-to-one uh, -one, if i can use that uh, uh, then you're leaving nothing to the reader uh, then except they just get what they see and uh, read so the more open you can leave small little bits to interpretation and that can be emotional uh, uh, things that's mostly the connection that we have with other people that is uh, these uh, or people will identify themselves as in, in these little emotional uh, 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 frustration uh, attachments uh, marriages uh, relationships uh. <clears throat> but if you yeah spell it out then uh, you you lose uh, way too much of the reader's uh, interest. Yeah, the uh, Amazon, which Teddy keeps referencing, this is a Italy edition. That's what I have by my desk for some reason. Italy or Spanish? Uh, is it? Oh, it's Norma. It's Spanish. Yeah, Spanish. Uh, perfect. Looks like I planned it, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> 
asking you know, that. that. That book functions on one of my favorite things about comics, and you can do it in other visual storytelling, but there are three narrative threads in that book that are contradicting each other. Uh, and they, you, you have what you're seeing, you have what he's writing about what's happening, which is one level delayed response, so he's processing, and you have what he writes about what happened much later. So all of those things are in, are in contradiction with one another at various places, and I want the reader to go, which one of these things is the thing? You know, because it's, it's a book about, uh, in a lot of ways, perceptions and, and how you interpret things. And so making the reader be the person who has to interpret the symbols overtly is really fun. Uh, I like that kind of stuff. Teddy and I also love Matadi and Matadi books, you know, you have to do a lot of work to figure out what is this? Like what, what literally is happening? Not in a bad way. The storytelling is beautiful. The art's beautiful. And, you know, if, if there's script it's usually really interesting but it's a book that makes you come over here and yeah. do some work uh and i you know i think as teddy and i become really old men in comics we'll start doing that shit where people are like what the hell was that <laughs> I, I think that's fair i think you know i like a book like that i like a when i was a kid i read lady or the tiger which i hate it's a short story where there's two doors and one's got a lady and one's got a tiger and you don't know there's nothing you can change they just decided to do it Streaming is on. We're back again. Uh, sorry, guys, YouTube doing their thing. Uh, you were saying about Amazon, you were completing the, your thoughts. Well, I, strangely enough, I was talking about the lady or the tiger and how it the stopped. Tiger, sorry about that. Stops with no warning, and you just have to decide what happens next. We should have ended the interview right there because it would have been an interview that stopped where people don't know what happens next and they would have had to go on with their life and decide. And it would have been perfect. I'm sorry about that. Not, I, I'm, I'm sorry only that we are now talking again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I used to be, as a creator, very concerned about making sure I was very specific and, and in pointy, and now I'm the opposite. I'm concerned that I'm too specific and too end point driven <laughs> and I'm trying to avoid that. Mm -hmm. But also, what you do, you're talking about Matoti. I, I, one thing that I always love about Matoti or Topi or th th these, so, th these kind of creators is that I think they work through emotion. I mean, in, in every corner of it, Matotti always thought, at least that's what he told me when he, I met him many years ago, that for him, colors are only emotions. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, you can see it in his work. It's the storytelling devices, and I, and I wanted to ask you about it, to, to tell you to, it's color as a storytelling device. Have you ever thought, and this is going to sound like a weird question, because I'm a weird guy, as you all know, for knowing me for more than 20 years, have you ever thought about the colors as sounds? Oh, absolutely. I see what you call it, the whole uh, language as, a, as a, what you call it. When I start doing a book, what I'm always searching for is uh, the tone of the book, the, uh, the voice of the book. And that's the, that's the hardest part, I think. Uh, the rest is just uh, a lot of hard work of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, a lot of work where you're just uh, executing to some way, but of course, uh, uh, what do you call it? But not with, uh, not with uh, just a one page, two page, three page. Uh, but the hardest part is always finding that tone and being in constant doubt about: Is this the right tone? Is this the ah fuck no? I I don't know if this is uh, right. Um, so that is we. Uh, uh, what you call it, uh, in, uh, music uh, orientated in my ears. Yeah, that's the other part I, I wanted to ask you because for me, always uh, comics are, as we said, colors are a storytelling tool that for me it has sounds, but also it's when you connect it to sounds, that's when I connect comic storytelling, at least the, the one I like, with a symphony. Yeah. Mm. But it's uh, many people think that comic has to be linear, but I don't. I think they have to have ups, lows, changes of pace. You know, the moment when boom, you get the big blow with the with the horns or with the drums or whatever, and then you go soft with the violin, and when you don't expect, you go back to the drums. For for me, that's why I always say comics are math, comics are symphony, are music, and comics are sounds. And that's when people look at me like you're crazy. But I think that's the, the part that they don't want to see. They want the linear. 
Yeah, and I need the impulse on comics that comics really don't have. What do you think, Steve? You know, I lay out my stories on graph paper because I look at them mathematically. I look at I look at rhythm before I look at plot. Yes. So I look at where I want density and where I want non-density and where I want a giant moment or I want to rush you to something and then leave you with something. So I, I'm always doing grids of what that's going to feel like before I know what it is. Mm -hmm. But you interpret it to us. Uh, is consciously you talk about the math, but consciously for you is also music, or is unconscious? Uh, the pacing. Poetry for me more than music, and I don't mean I don't mean the words, the text poetry, but poetry is fascinating because you know, like a, a novel is you tell a story in as many words as it takes, and poetry is you tell a story in as few words as you can get away with, mm -hmm. uh, and it's often about a feeling instead of about a plot, which I'm into, uh, and it's often about the the absences instead of what's there. Like you know, in a poem, if you go, uh, "Girl, cocoa puffs, bird flying," it's like, well, what what does that mean? You know, is, is the girl the Cocoa Puffs? Does she want the Cocoa Puffs? I know the girl wants the Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> and then why is there a bird all of a sudden? Is the bird the girl's bird? Like, so all that. She already ate cereal. Oh, she already ate cereal. That's good. I'm, I'm talking about a poem about you, though. Whatever. Whatever. She's my teacher's meeting right now. Okay. Uh, Anyway, you know, it's it's the absences, the gaps, and panels in a comic are the same thing. You know, there's a, a space between that the reader has to deal with. Uh, so it's, it's poetic that way. And it's also it's, it's about it's also about the the part that gives us a superpower. As my other regular joke, as comics reader, is that from the very get go, we need to learn how to read what's not there. Always, what's not there is. We go Superman again. Open, next thing he's flying. In the movie, you have to show open, walks, jumps, flies. So we cover it. And I always do the same, say the same thing. That gives us a lot of insight into when we read novels or poems or we look at the TV show or whatever on TV or the news, we always tend to read between the lines. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the power of that edit is so cool in comics. Like open. Superman laying in bed asleep. Open, fist in face. Yeah. Open, having a cup of coffee. You know, the, the moment after the moment defines the gap. And yeah. that's what's so cool. And a lot of people don't use that at all in comics. They're like, open, step, arm up. It's like, you're doing comics. That, that's what I was going to say. Why are you doing comics if you don't use the gaps in your benefit? And the gaps are, as you just said, he's flying or he's having a coffee or he's talking to Lois in bed, if we have that notion in our favor, why don't we use it more? Uh, where's the limit on that? Because I don't think this, as I was talking yeah. about, to Scott McLeod a month ago, and he was talking about all the, we were like three hours talking about the theories and the formalism and all that. But by the end, I just literally asked him, but do you really think comics have limits? Because I don't. And he came to my side and said, no, there is, there really isn't. There's forms of, of interpreting it, but if we're good with what we do, if we know what we're doing, if we're good, good comic storytellers, there shouldn't be any limits to what we say. Yeah. I, I have to pick my wife up, so uh, I, I will have to put a time limit on the rest of my conversation. But, uh, you know, it's, it's somebody said yesterday during dinner, there's there's 12 notes and all the music that's ever been made has been made with those 12 notes. Now, granted, there's more than 12 notes because of half tones, but people can make a ton of music with 12 notes over thousands of years. You know, there's there's certain pigments that the eye can see. You can make an infinite number of paintings with those. Yes. There are X number of letters in an alphabet. You can arrange them in an in infinite number of ways. Absolutely. So, you know, why comics too often bogs down and goes, oh, here's how you tell it. Oh, decompressed storytelling, compressed story. Like, who cares about that? There's yeah. so much other stuff you can do than that. Absolutely. Okay, since this is, you're going to have to go fast, uh, quick, let me get to the people's questions. So don't they don't think we're, we're ignoring them. If you're fine with that, Pedro de Mercader, hello, everyone. Congress for It's a Bird. How did you manage to tell such a personal and experimental story with the biggest toy uh, icon, how do we remember the pitch for that 
Pedro, you asked this, he already answered this. So Psychically, he answered he you, Pedro. Power, he has powers. Steve has powers. <laughs> we discovered many things about Steve. The other one, he has powers. So sorry, Pedro. He already answered that. Drink and Draw Social Club chapter in Costa Rica. Okay. Hello from Costa Rica. Awesome, awesome, awesome answers, you guys. We, we need to go to that social chapter in, yeah. in Costa Rica. So whenever you can invite us, please. <laughs> we'll go, we'll go, right? we we'll go, right, guys? I'll go tomorrow, except they won't let me leave my state. Uh, okay, when 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 we're able to. Uh, Drink Control Social Club, please make it happen. But then, Mikhail, how did you end up working in the Sandman universe? How is it working with Neil Gaiman? I worked on Sandman Mystery Theater. You worked on Sandman Midnight Theater. I did not, I, I interacted with Neil on occasion, but I didn't work with him. I worked with Matt Wagner. But, Teddy, you worked directly with Neil and Matt. On a couple of occasions, uh, also did uh, Neil did one of my solo stories, mm -hmm. uh, and that he's a uh, like Steve, a wonderful collaborator, just like uh, Matt is a fantastic uh, writer as well. He's a uh, smart. Uh, I like working with the uh, smart writers that are. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, doing run of the mill uh, kind of stuff. Uh, very uh, easy to work with. Very uh, open, just like Steve uh, is. Uh, yeah, what can I say? Uh, you can say that I not that I as I always repeat, and some writers hate me for it. A writer who's not open to listen to his artist who should not do be, be doing comics. No, it's less, this uh, dictatorship in uh, comics is not a, a benefit for neither artist or uh, like stubborn artists that just want their way is also not what you No, doing. it makes bad comics. It makes for bad comics when uh, where there's an dictatorship from the artist or from the writer. It's got to be a synergy between both. Yeah, I won't make excuses for all of all of them or us, uh, but I will say that it's, it's really insecurity. It's because, mm -hmm. you know, when I was younger and I couldn't draw, I was afraid I wasn't doing enough or that I was doing the wrong stuff, or that I, you know, like, it's it's insecurity that leads to that control for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more secure you get in working with people and working with yourself, the more you can let that go. Absolutely. Jose Francisco Martinez, hello. Oh, you, you were going to say something, Teddy? I say, but that's also why, uh, what you're going, where you will get uh, surprises uh, along the way that you won't get if you're controlling the everything. And hopefully nice surprises, not just the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've had both kinds, but the other kind is still a challenge to solve with storytelling, and that's fine, too. Yeah. Okay. Jose Francisco Martinez, hello, Teddy. Hello, Steve. Uh, can they show... Oh, so, can they show something from the new project they're working on? If this was Zoom, I could I could do that, but I don't I don't know this portal, so I... Yeah, I that's, that's easy. You go to the... Steve, you go to the screen... Share your screen part. I yeah, I'm, I'm going to share my screen because I have a lot of work that I'm doing open on it, and I don't no, have time no, to close no, it you, can, you can pick. You can pick the. You can pick the. The, the folder. The folder you want to show. But if you don't want to risk it, don't worry about it. Don't worry. Teddy, about do you want to? Do you want to show something like the zebra submarine or something? Yeah, uh, we can find something. Meanwhile, I'll ask you another question, Steve, uh, because this one is for you, yeah. Steve. How much of your experience in comic have uh, has served you to write? movies or for the work in the Ben 10 series? Uh, I mean, working in animation on Ben 10 specifically, uh, it, it helps. It definitely helps because there's an economy to animation that comics shares. Um, it's a different medium. So it has its own toolbox that you've got to master. It's a different age demo than I usually work in in comics. I started doing the Camp Midnight books because kids who love Ben 10 or Big Hero 6 or whatever would come up and say, you know, the parents at convention like, what of your books can my kids read? And I'm like, none of them. They're R-rated. Uh, so I started tr try to do some kids' books. Kids' stuff is much harder. Like, you have fewer words, basically, that you can use. So if I need to say, uh, you know, uh, prognosis, and that's not going to fly for a seven-year-old, I've got to figure out how a seven-year-old says prognosis. Uh, and that's, I find that very challenging of all the writing that I do. Um, but it... Comics is good training in general because it is, it crosses, it's storyboarding, it's comics, it's in some cases film, we've covered in many ways why it's not, but it is not a bad primer for that. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely helps. 
Okay, another one. You talked uh, that your way to get in touch was via faxes. If you had to make some little changes uh, of, or any kind of details, how was the communication to do that? Well, Teddy and I worked on House of Secrets with phone calls that cost more than we made on the book, I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm in LA and he's in Copenhagen. And back then there was no Skype and no free way to get like, if we had to talk to each other, it was going to be a lot of money. And you know, you can tell when we talk together, it lasts for quite a while. Uh, so if there were emergencies or like, I don't know, or whatever, it had to be a phone call and it was really expensive. So we'd try to get off quickly. The truth is the collaborative process in comics. What's so great is I send a script, he sends breakdowns. I send dialogue. He sends pencils. We see inks. We get so there are moments where you can adapt to whatever's happening and fix it. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's something broken or improve it if there's something growing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's mostly how we did it then. Now you can just co collaborate live on the internet. Uh, yeah. So it's very different these days. Yeah. Uh, whenever you're ready, you let us know. Okay. Okay, Teddy. No rush. Yeah. Ezekiel Shapira. Saludos, David. Hello, Ezekiel. Pedro Mercader, for the the comic is for me the most creative art. I find uh, there's so some bold, weird, crazy ideas and solution that it would be impossible to use if you tried in a, in a novel or a movie. Do you agree? Totally agree. And uh, go make comics, sir, because that's the right attitude. <laughs> he wants to. Uh, do you have approach the all of your projects uh, doing the same? previous process like before you actually start you know writing or is it necessary to adapt your train of thoughts your, the way you think for each one of them i intentionally change the way i work on every project so that i don't get bored or stagnant mm -hmm. uh like the camp midnight books i i did i started on page one and i wrote to page 120 uh and i would reread whatever i'd written and then just keep writing 10 more pages at a time uh with no outline like because i always outline and i was like i need to let go of the outline and just see if I can survive page to page. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it, it was terrifying, but that was good. And there were things about it that worked really well that I will now put in my toolbox. And there were other things that got rushed because I didn't think enough ahead in my my, my mind. But I, and then I won't do another book that way. Like that's the book I did that way. And I won't do another one like that. <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> well, no, but literally because there are other ways to get there. So huh? I, it's, not, it's not that it scared me away. It's that now I've done that mm -hmm. and now I will do something else. Okay, absolutely. Uh, Pedro, hi, good afternoon to all of you. I'll just share my screen. Okay, right. go for it. Uh, oh, shit. It says uh, share, yes. Share this. Screen sharing failed. What, oh. is, what kind of permissions uh, do I have to give here? Anyway, a uh, question for Teddy. How does your, that's a, that's a nice one, your Nordic sex sensibility fits with the American way of doing comics? I find uh, that your style feels like it's pretty unusual for that market, for, your, for what you can do, you can find in comics in America. Well, it's a constant surprise for myself that uh, <laughs> every time I'm, <laughs> I'm, what do you call it? accepted a project it's a wonderful surprise that there still is a market for anything mm -hmm. uh, what you call it it's an open market no matter what you uh, what you do and it's uh, i think uh, yeah it's a it's a it's nice to see that the world is uh, if you think it's a a closed uh, area. I thought that doing uh, comics for American publishers was an uh, uh, absolutely never going to happen thing. And then one, two, three, then uh, yeah, it happened uh, because there was something in the way that I was doing stuff that could uh, interest the uh, editors to begin with, uh, and then later readers. Uh, uh, so I think it's uh, it's if there's anybody sitting out there, uh, it's like sending a book. Uh, if you think uh, that 
if you have an idea for a book and you get a no from, uh, you send it to a publisher, you get a no, then uh, don't give up because there is, uh, God knows how many publishers out there and there's uh, a publisher for each strange project. Uh, so it's all about determination, tenacity, uh, just keep pushing it in there. And if you get the same feedback from uh, from all the publishers that you've sent it to, then uh, uh, what you call it, yeah, then there's something that you need to look at. Something that you need to change. <laughs> but but then also, I think that's also a mistake. I don't know if you agree, guys, uh, about thinking that we are not in a global comic world now because there's so many influences. There's been, since you guys started, you know, so many influences going around, reaching almost everybody, that by the end of the day, readers are a lot more willing to see something different to what they see every day, also because they're fucking bored uh, out of uh, watching the same thing over and over. Yeah. And it got to a point with Vertigo, with Image, with, you know, what it's been done out, out of the, what we call classic direct market, you know, what Raina Tegelmeyer or Noel Stevenson and any other people is doing, that by the end of the day, I think the market is much bigger out of what we think. We keep thinking about direct market, and I keep telling people, don't don't fucking watch or read the diamond uh, uh, shelling list. Go get you know the book scan. Those are the real numbers. This yeah, I mean, Reina Reina's got the highest selling books in comics in in America, if not the world. You know, well, not probably not the world because of Japan, but uh, for sure in America by far, by yeah. far. And they're they're not even represented on diamond. And as I, as I was telling Scott, and do you think he cares? Because he was a student yeah. of Scott. He's like, no, it's, it's a different world. She lives in the real world. We don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I, I don't think it's about whether she cares or not. It's just interesting that you know we're obsessed with what is the market. That's the market. You know that her her books combined uh, account for like half of any month of all the other books or something. So yeah, you know we, we need to be thinking more broadly. Absolutely. Uh, which comics did blow you guys away in the in that in that formal aspect? I think he's, he means the the format or trying to you know change things. As I talked to you about earlier, I like what uh, Jorge Gonzalez from uh, Madrid is uh, is doing. Um, I love what uh, Javier Olivares uh, uh -huh. is is doing as well. He's always doing wonderful, pushing himself. Uh, yeah. uh, I love what Machotti is doing. Um, uh, what else? Who else do I love? Uh, I love what McKean uh, pushes. Uh, what else? Uh, I love uh, Blutch, uh, French artist uh, Blutch. Um, of comic uh, people, who else do I love? That's always I, I, all of those are good with me, you know. Charles Burns uh, is always like, "What? What is happening here?" I like the gaps in that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I loved the book now of Brown that Glenn Dillon did, uh, and it, it was a more, it had a linear run, but then it had some intrusive elements. I'm like, "What? What are these supposed to mean?" Mm -hmm. That was interesting to me. Uh, you know, there's some cool stuff in Japan that's, you know, manga that's all over the place, really experimental that I, I like. Um, I, I got a page up from our project, but I can't, I don't have a button to share a screen for some reason. So Nah, I, don't worry about it. We can, Guys, you can see it on Twitter later, or we will fix another way. Another time, another time you come to, to see it. Uh, Drink and Draw Social Club, Chester, Costa Rica. Anytime you guys you want, when this is over, anytime come to Costa Rica. Okay. Yeah, now we're talking. Let's end on that. You guys make it happen for us. We 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 game. Uh, Jose Francisco Martinez. Uh, are they going to use the pandemic situation and the distant way to communicate? And I guess the, that we don't have the chance to see each other. In your case, uh, in person, to create a future uh, by a biographical story like uh, Dupuy and Berberianda do. He's saying. Well, well, first of all, I love those guys too. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, what you call it? Well, all what you call it? Steve has come to go to Denmark almost once a year. Uh, pretty steady uh, and 
what you call it, uh, that's of course on hold with this uh, goddamn pandemic. Teddy got me a gig teaching at an animation school over there. Uh, so I, I come over once or twice a year, but I just had to do my first over Zoom version of the class this year because of the, the pandemic. So yeah, the weird thing is comic book creators have worked at home like this forever. Yes. So when, they, when the shutdown came, I was like, oh, I, I did this all the time. I know what this is. Uh, and didn't really feel all that different to me, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Another uh, book I forgot to mention that I read recently was uh, Adrian Tomine's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many, what you call it, situations where I was going, oh, yeah, I've been. <laughs> <laughs> all of you, all of you, Albert Montes told me yesterday, he's reading the same book. All of you are reading the same book, and, and all of you are like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just like that. Some of you are like, yeah, and some are like, yeah. Well, yeah. Signing with nobody at it, been there. Yeah, exactly. That up at the Eisner's, been there a few times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, uh, Jose, Jose Francisco clarifies, the Pueblo Beria Nicolás de Cristian Pedrosa, I was mentioning oh, artists, okay, yeah. that Teddy likes. Uh, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, Why well, we haven't mentioned Bill Sienkiewicz? Say again? I just, I just I helped mention Bill Sienkiewicz. Bill bought a house here and I was like, Bill, let me come over because I'm really good at uh, structural inspection, which I am strangely. Uh, so I, I got to spend the day with him uh, crawling under his crawl space and stuff. But in the, in the intervening moments, having little Bill Sienkiewicz conversations, I was super fanboy. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's amazing. Anyway. Uh, and also, sorry, no, no comics conversation with me should not uh, end without mentioning Love and Rockets, which is uh, experimental in its longevity, if nothing else. Uh, yeah quality no and, and I, I i keep saying i was expecting this by the way the love and rockets mentioned so i can say my part which is it was so ahead of its time mm -hmm. so ahead of its time and it still is in a big way yeah but that I, when when i talk to people about influences for creators many times i mention jaime or beto and they don't see it They're like go back just go back <laughs> and see how ahead of their time they were in many many things that we're seeing now not people being better than them, just trying to emulate them. Yeah. Jaime bought a house nearby me, uh, and I see him at the comic shop back when we could go to the comic shop quite regularly or at the grocery store. And I'm I'm so smitten as a fanboy that I am just an idiot every time. And I he must think I'm like a stalker or a killer or something. Because uh, I can't, I just cannot communicate when I'm in his presence. Uh, and I just seem, like I seem now, like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> They're both geniuses. Um, one last question, because I know, Steve, you need to leave. Um, is there anything, as a, as, a, as, a, as a pair, as a couple of creators, as a team, whatever you prefer, uh, and sep or, or separate, whatever you're going to say it, that's been nagging you for many, many years. Like, I want to do this in comics before I die or retire or whatever you want to think about it. But you've never been able to, and you, you keep saying, we are going to do this sooner or later, but we're going to do it. No, I think we're doing it. Which yeah, we've been pretty fortunate to get to do it. Like, even on a Vertigo book like House of Secrets, we got away with a lot of stuff. It's a bird. We got away with murder, uh, you know, and the, the projects we've done since then have people have really let us do often to their dismay what we want to uh, so i think we're very fortunate and to be able to keep doing that is the dream mm -hmm. well yeah i have to say the same yeah i have one project that uh what you call it i'm doing on the side what you call it for myself uh, uh, which is a biography um but uh I want to write a fake biography, uh, uh, so I still need to do that. <laughs> I want to make it so uh, uh, hopefully people think that this is uh, an actual person that this uh, they go. You, it's and, very uh, weird that you would say that because I was working with uh, Ryan Hughes a couple of years ago on a Vertigo thing that got killed when the Vertigo implosion happened. We we hadn't started; we had just talked through it and done the proposal, but it had been approved. And it was a hoax. Like I'm very interested in the hoax comic. 
we should talk offline at some point. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that, don't get close because then people is going to realize it's a hoax from the beginning. You know, that's that. that it was. I remember when Marvel, you know, announced the Sentry thing, and they yeah. did such a good job, you know, with the thing that's Stan. They found something Stan created and all that. That was a lot of fun. It was a hoax from the beginning. But yeah, so I guess the fake media push has now made that just boring. That, all right, that, I gotta go, but it's been a delight. Yes, let me just show you a thing before you leave. Da, 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 da. I like I like in the Zoom era you can walk away and go get stuff. Hey, it's House of Secrets. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> oh, very cool. Writing. Is that from our, our trip to Madrid? I give these guys gave me I don't remember if it was 99 or 2000 when when you were together in Madrid with me. So was 20 years ago, it's still hanging in there as a, as a really precious memory. Or, or nice. And sure. to thank you guys for all, forever, for always, for always, forever, for everything. Well, thanks for thanks for letting me see the Ganica live and in person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, you guys. Please don't cut because I want to say proper goodbye to you after I cut the live feed. But uh, to all of you watching, thank you so much. Thank you for hanging on after you know the crazy shit with the connection <laughs> and staying with us. Please wear your mask. Don't be assholes. Wear your mask. Don't make me want. To, don't make me go to your house and kick your fucking balls. Or some. I like, I like that. What? I like that ending. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, because you missed the start with me ranting about the people who doesn't wear a mask. Anyway, yeah, they're they're not right. good. For, good for you. Good for you that you missed that part. Anyway, have a good weekend, people. With us on Monday, Mr. Jeff Lemire. Ooh. Stay cool. Stay safe. Don't be assholes. Take care of others. Wear your mask. Bye. In three.